school board by staggering the term so they all wouldn't turn over in one year. When a whole board turns over, that's caused problems. Well, instead of just amending that, uh, the governor has now decided to make this a partisan issue and, and try to throw out the whole board by having a special election this year. And that would cost the taxpayers money. Uh, the governor's talked about having a more efficient government and not say and not spending money. Well, he wants to have an election this year would only be for one year, and then we'd have to have another one in the year after that. That causes a hardship. Uh, it also, uh, frankly, it, those those people there were elected by the citizens for their full term. And, and that bill was to, again, provide more... Uh, continuity going forward. So it is my hope that the Senate will will uh, kill that that amendment because again, I don't believe it's germane and it certainly uh, is not beneficial to the taxpayers or the citizens uh, of Loudoun County. I, I will just add when you look at the amendment, it really appears that this is part of Governor Yunkin's ongoing campaign against uh, public schools. Um, we, it is incredibly important that we have continuity with our school boards. Uh, they have been dealing with some controversial issues, important issues, and certainly we, uh, we should all be willing to support school board members and the public service they are giving to us. So to act, to, to take the rug out from under them and ask all of them to run again uh, in 2022 with, for no good reason, there was no reason articulated in his amendment, um, I have to believe it is just part of this larger strategy of undermining the uh, the ability of school boards to really govern our public schools. And it is my hope and strong desire that the uh, Senate defeats the bill, defeats the amendments. Thank you, Senators. Um, Drew Wilder with NBC, um, your hand is raised. You can now talk. Thank you. Um, question for uh, Senator Eben. Uh, Adam, you, you touched on this briefly, but you know the uh, the governor's veto pen was particularly strong against the bills that that you sponsored, and and more broadly, particularly aggressive against bills that came from legislators in Northern Virginia. Can you can you elaborate a little bit more on on the optics of that and and what? you think the governor might be trying to communicate by, by really coming after uh, the NOVA legislators in particular? Right. Um, I think the governor, you, you know, I can't read his mind, but he, um, he seems to take issue with people who voted against his nomination of uh, Trump EPA administrator, uh, Andrew Wheeler, for, uh, to be the Virginia Secretary of uh, Natural Resources, which is why I think he vetoed so many of my bills. His office didn't communicate uh, uh, before the vetoes directly since the session has ended, since the session ended. But the, I think I said in my statement that we need a governor to be governor for, for all Virginians. And um, he's not, he, when, you, when you go after legislators from one region or one party, that doesn't really send that signal at all without giving a rationale if you do have a difference with the bill. I hope that answers the question. It does. Sorry, Drew. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. Um, Jack Cleo asks um, specifically on the new penalties for marijuana, would the caucus's policy preferences be better met by not passing any bill as opposed to passing the amendments on that? Can't hear you. Um, on marijuana, would the caucus's policy preferences be better? met by not passing any bill as opposed to passing the amendments on the hangar bill? And do these actions affect the caucus's thoughts going into budget negotiations? I'll take a crack at that, if that's okay. Uh, it, we have not discussed as a caucus the amendments to the hemp bill, but um, I don't think this is gonna affect, impact the budget, the, uh, the amendments to the hemp uh, legislation. Uh, the governor has, uh, Given us some things to to consider there that are that may that may have some merit, uh, but I don't want to speak for everyone else in the caucus. Uh, I will just add uh, to Senator Evans' comments. Um, I mean, I think the governor does two important things in his amendment. Um, one, he sort of draws the line on the Delta Eight uh, uh, tetrahydro cannabin uh, cannabin oil uh, uh, threshold, which I think is an important amendment actually. And 
regarding the budget implication, there is language in his amendment that directs the cannabis uh, control authority to implement uh, to the degree possible as much um, enforcement um, as would be appropriate for the uh, for the task at hand. So <laughs> that's sort of the amendment. I'm not sure exactly what that means, which is why I think Senator Eben probably noted it's uh, difficult at this point to determine uh, what impact uh, the that language would have in terms of adding additional dollars to enforcement. But certainly there has been strong bipartisan support for strong enforcement mechanisms. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, can, I, can, I just, can I just say yeah, something too? I mean, I mean, first of all, the, the, the conundrum presented by this amendment just sort of reflects the how much the governor doesn't understand how to do this. Okay, because the, the bill, the amendments, the language he's trying to amend, we spent probably about, I want to say maybe six to eight hours in meetings of about 10 different people between adjournment and veto session last year, arriving at the compromise that we arrived at. And it took a lot of work of a lot of people. And if you're going to propose policy that gets in and tries to undo some of those compromises and, 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 and add to it other policy choices, you need to approach the people who have to vote on the bill and have a dialogue, have some conversation about what it is you want to try to do to build support for the amendment before you make it, because the governor only gets one shot at an amendment. And after the amendment's made, it can't be amended. And so I think perhaps if the governor had had some conversation and dialogue with us before proposing it, we'd be a lot more likely to say yes or no on it. But given the fact that we weren't consulted on this at all before it got proposed, you know, the odds of it getting approved probably declined because it gets into some stuff that was very delicately drafted compromises that were made last year. So I would just, you know, this, these questions all highlight these things. I mean, much, many of us had very little dialogue before any of these things were proposed. And that's a real problem. It's not the right way to govern. And to follow on that, I think Patrick Wilson posed a follow-up question in the chat about whether there could be a fiscal impact uh, with the governor's proposal for new misdemeanors in the uh, in the bill in his uh, amendments to the hangar bill. And the answer is there could be an impact. Yes. And a follow-up on that: Is there um, it, does that fiscal impact have any impact on our budget negotiations going forward? I'm not a budget conferee, but um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, it, it certainly could have a role. That would have to be determined. I, I, would, I would hope that, I would hope that it would not. Um, and I think that um, they're, they're moving towards uh, an agreement. And uh, I don't think that, uh, that, while it's not helpful, I don't think this will stop it. Yeah, I would agree. Thank everyone for joining us today. Um, if you have any further questions, please let me know.